Okay, please. All right. All right. It's going safer. Almighty and everlasting God, we give you thanks for gathering us here once more this morning on this, uh, this beautiful Sunday morning. Grant us your blessing now as we continue to study um, your hands and your work in former days, but also the significance and implications of that still to ours. So grant us your grace and mercy as, um, as we seek daily to, um, to be faithful in our confession to the truth of Scripture and to Christ. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. So this morning, um, we are going to finish talking about the Council of Nicaea. We pretty much got everything except for the big topic. So, um, so that's what we're going to look at today. Um, it's, so we're using the same handout from the last couple of weeks. There's a couple more copies on the table over there in the corner if you need one. Um, so, correct, correct, yeah. So, um, the handout on the Council of Nicaea, we, um, we talked about uh, kind of the, uh, everything that led up to this and why, um, why there was the council in the first place, who the different parties and groups were. We dealt with, um, there's three major questions. We talked about two of them, um, the dating of Easter, and then um, what to do with a, um, a division, um, a schism in the church, um, particularly in North Africa. So um, now today we're getting to this, um, this last major question here. Um, which was really the, the big, by far the biggest issue of, of the day. Um, and that's, um, that's that of, um, of Arius and his, um, his theology about Jesus. Again, that Jesus is a God, not the God. So Arius denies the Trinity um, and believed that Jesus, and promoted that Jesus was a creation. The first, um, the first thing that um, that basically God the Father created, and then through Him created everything else. Okay, so um, again, a modern day uh, comparison um, would be the Jehovah's Witnesses I believe in a very very similar way and use a lot of the same reasoning. Um, that the Arians did. So we're going to look at this and uh, see how the how the Council of Nicaea addressed that, um, but also look at a couple of these Bible passages that Arius uh, really latched onto, and take a look at that, um, especially in light of the rest of Scripture, to see what it, what do these Bible passages talk about, and, and uh, how do we address these things. Then we'll just uh, do a, kind of a final conclusion on that. So what kind of what happened after the council? Right? Where were the um, the implications of that, and uh, what changed, if anything, afterwards? So um, as we we started talking about a little bit last week, um, it got to this. It got to uh, the point where they started talking about this. Yeah. Eusebius of Caesarea um, presenting a creed, a statement of faith about Jesus, about God, and, um, and Christ. Um, an old one that can be found in Palestine, and the Arians were willing to accept it, which made the Orthodox party um, really nervous and saying again, if you, if you guys agree with this, then we're obviously not being clear enough because our differences are real. And, um, and that was too general of a statement. Okay? So they debated on and on about this kind of um, stuff. And what it really came down to was, was um, a single letter and a word. A single letter. Okay. And the word, um, this is on the bottom of page 28 in your handout. Um, the word um, is homoousius. 
homoousios. And the Arians hated that word. And that's not a it's not a break, it's not a new word. They didn't just invent it here. Um, but it was a word that had been talked about before, but it's not a word that shows up in the Bible. Okay? Um, but it's a word that now they're using to describe what happens. The same as the word Trinity, right? Trinity never shows up in the Bible, but it's a word that the church says, this is a good word to describe what the Bible is talking about. Okay. So, homoousius means the same, so that's homo, right? Same. Um, Usius means substance. Substance. So the word homo usius means, um, in reference, it says that Jesus is the same substance as the Father. He is the same substance as the Father. And the Arians couldn't accept the that. The Arians couldn't accept that. A little bit later on, they promote um, homoi. Usius, which you add um, the, the Greek letter um, iota, which is the I, okay? which means a similar substance, but not the same. Similar, but not the same. Where did that letter go? Where does it go in the word? It would go in between the O's. Okay. In between the O's. So it shows up on the next page in the handout. I write it out there somewhere. Okay. About the middle of the page. So if I say this to my great uncle, he knows what I was talking about. Probably not. Okay. I don't know. Maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe. In English, we certainly would. So in English, this is the word that shows up in the Nicene Creed. Okay, so in the Nicene Creed, it says, and um, right, and I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, um, and it goes on. Um, it says, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. Okay, the uh, the Roman Catholic Church, their modern English translation says, consubstantial. Um, which that works too. Um, consubstantial. Um, the same substance. Okay? So in the Nicene Creed, this that whole beginning part of the creed is all written against Arius and his followers. Right? So it says, The only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds. Okay. So before creation. So the Arians at this time, could they could track and they could say, I'll agree with that. But then it goes on. God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. Okay? So what that part of the Nicene Creed really is just saying is Jesus is God. Um, and if you didn't understand it, let me tell you a different way. <laughs> <laughs> this is God. This is God. Jesus is God. We need that. Right? <laughs> no, not with the little G. Right? Not with the little G. Okay? So, God of God, which meaning of the same thing, right? Light of light, of the same thing. Very God of very God. So, truly, really God. Right? <laughs> Um, really God. <laughs> um, and then begotten, okay? But not, again, but not made. So not a creation. So part of it too was, well, what does it mean to be, what's it, what is begotten? Right? And when, um, at least in our, in our minds, I think most of the time in churchy language, we think the old King James version of the Bible. Right? That so and so begat, so and so begat, so and so begat, so right. and so. Right? So, like a father and a son relationship. And the Arians were even willing to say, yeah, that's fine. Um, we could say begotten um, in the sense that 
Um, in the same way that you know you have a natural child that comes from your body, right? That Jesus um, comes from God, but isn't the same thing. It doesn't share the same substance. Even though the substance comes from God, it's not the same. It's something different. And doesn't that go back to where we started in the very beginning, that the Word was God, was with God? Okay. I mean, when we make Jesus the Word... So, John 1, I mean, John 1 is a pretty important passage when it comes to this. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, the world translation of the Holy Spirit says the word was a God. The word was a God. A God. Yeah, they just oh, banned it. Right. And that's why they're walking. <laughs> See, that's exactly the opposite of what the truth is. Right. Right. Yes, sir. What would they do with the text that talks about conceived by the Holy Spirit? Okay. So, that um, that's just talking about the humanity part. Right. Right. Right? So that um, that wasn't really an issue. They were okay with that. They were okay with that. Because that's talking about the humanity, not the divinity. So, um, there were two passages that the Arians really jumped on to try to prove their point. So if you have your Bible, turn to, um, turn to Proverbs chapter 8. And we looked at these briefly. Um, and I want to uh, I want to address each of these two um, to see where they where it's gone wrong. Okay, so Proverbs chapter eight. If you don't have a Bible, that's fine. Just um, just listen. We're just um, um, going to cover again these two passages primarily. So um, Proverbs eight. Uh, this shows up a little bit in Proverbs 3, a similar thing, but um, that's a lot more vague. So here's the big thing. Proverbs 8, verse 22. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22. Um, it says here, um, The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. And the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, First of his acts, so no. Chapter 8 of Proverbs is talking about wisdom. And wisdom personified. Okay? Which um, which the church has always, um, almost always said, this is Jesus. That's what this is talking about. Wisdom personified is Jesus, just like love personified is Jesus. Okay? And that kind of thing. Okay? So. Here, um, in verse 22, the word um, possessed yeah. is what mine has. There's a little note, and the note in here um, says, in my Bible, says, um, down at the bottom, says, for father. Yeah. But the Septuagint, so that's the Greek translation, translates that Hebrew word as created. So it would read, the Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of it. So Arius says, look, Bible <coughs> I'm reading says, um, the Lord created wisdom, and we all agree that wisdom is Jesus. So the Lord created Jesus, the first act before he did it. So, um, in English, well, so that's, that comes from a, um, a bad translation, is what it comes from. Yeah. So the word in Hebrew, again, um, possess, can also mean father, right? So it's kind of, a, you can see the connection from father to creator. Um, the word, though, um, that... Um, could also be appointed rather than possessed. Appointed, um, it can be translated into English. Now, the the translator used again this Greek word, um, trying to capture this, but um, but didn't do a good job, right? which led to a misunderstanding. 
about this. So the word in, uh, again, the word in Hebrew um, um, can mean uh, uh, possess or appointed. So if we read it that way, the word possess me or appointed me or even recognized me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. So um, this is why translation stuff matters. This is also why it's important that um, whoever pastor you have and whatever church you may go to should be able to, to read Greek and Hebrew and to, um, to look at this kind of stuff because one little word can make a big difference. So, um, so he's working off of this, I'll get to your question in a second. So he's working off of uh, this faulty translation, which at this time, though, the Greek translation of the Old Testament is kind of the standard de facto Bible that most people use. Because most of the most of the Gentiles don't know Hebrew or don't spend a lot of time in Hebrew. In fact, most the the standard Bible that was used during Jesus' day was the Septuagint, not the Hebrew. The Hebrew they used maybe in like church services and kind of formal things, but for the most part, they used the Greek translation of it. So most of the quotes in the New Testament that are quotes from the Old Testament are quotes from the Greek translation. Which why sometimes as you'll read through it, you're like, yeah, the wording is a tad different. And that's why. Okay, it's because they're true. Yeah, we're getting a translation of the translation. Oh, okay. yeah. So in this passage here, is that why they have the argument that since he's creating, it's not the same? Yes. Yep. So that's what Arian was saying. Because Jesus is he's a created being. He's not the same as God. He's not of the same substance. And I know it's a translation thing, but how do we, it, the, the, this passage addresses time and about the creation of the world, and how, how do right. we look at it? Okay, so, anybody have a good answer for that? Um, it's just wisdom. Okay. So, Here's, here's the easiest way. So, um, one, the um, first and foremost, the word created is not the right word. And that actually shows up in the Revised Standard Version and the New Revised Standard Version of the English Revision. Okay. So, if you have those, um, which most of us don't, that's not a super common translation. But um, they base their, their English off of, primarily off of the Septuagint. Um, the Orthodox study Bibles, or the Orthodox Bibles they use, they only use the Septuagint. So they recognize that oh, this is a uh, translation too. But um, if anything, have, you know, uh, people that have publications from the Orthodox church bodies, um, they also do the Old Testament primarily using the Septuagint. So the big thing, um, first kind of back up a little bit. Um, <coughs> Um, since we're kind of talking about some of these church fathers and we've mentioned some of the names, I'm going to throw them out to you guys as well. But um, Justin Martyr, um, who lived um, uh, around the year in the early 100s and then was martyred, okay? Um, he, he talks about how um, comments on Proverbs 8 that Jesus is begotten before creation, okay? Um, but he also says that Jesus is a distinct person of the Trinity. Okay. Um, going on a little bit in time, um, Irenaeus, um, in the second, later on in the second century, also makes similar statements. Okay, but he, rather than uh, attributing wisdom or Jesus saying that Jesus is wisdom, Irenaeus says that it, that wisdom is reference to the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, but still say this is um, the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity. Okay. This is a reference to God, not a God. Okay. 
So, um, um, going a little bit farther, um, origin. Um, origin um, uh, views wisdom as God the Son, um, and um, both the divine and human um, attributes that are wrapped up in this. Um, so, um, let me read. Let me read part of what Origin says. Then we'll answer this question specifically, um, because this is a helpful quote to helping us to understand why Arius could get to where he got. Okay. So Origin writes this: In the first place, we must note that the nature of the deity, which is in Christ, in respect of His being, the only begotten Son of God, is one thing. And that human nature, which he assumed in these last times for the purpose of grace, is another. Therefore, we have first to ascertain what the only begotten Son of God is, saying he is called by many different names, according to the circumstance and views of individuals. For he is termed wisdom here, according to this expression of Solomon, the Lord created me the beginning of his ways, and among his works, before he made any other thing, he founded me before the ages, in the beginning, before he formed the earth, before he brought forth the fountains of waters, before the mountains were made strong, before all the hills he brought me forth. He's also styled the firstborn, as the apostle has declared, who is the firstborn of every creature. That's Colossians 1.15. That's the next passage we're going to look at after we move from Proverbs. Okay. The firstborn, however, is not by nature a different person from wisdom. So we're not talking about two different things or people. But one and the same. Finally, the apostle Paul says that Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So, what, what Arius is doing and what some of the others is doing during this time it is they're reading Proverbs 8 in light of the New Testament, which is good. Right? That's a good thing to do. Um, that in the New Testament passages that talk about Jesus as the eternal God and coexisting with the Father before creation. Right? That he's there before creation. Okay? So, um, there's others that talk about this in the same way. Okay? Um, Again, but the word where the issue then comes in is created. So Origen and a couple of others are saying, look, Jesus is God. He's there before creation. And Origen doesn't have a problem with, cre with the word created. And neither does um, Tertullian or Cyprian um, and a couple of others that come right after it. So Arius says that must be these guys, right? Um, the previous generations didn't have a problem with this word. So I'm just reading it just as it plainly says, right, that he created. And if that, if it didn't mean that, then surely Origen and Tertullian would have said it means something else. So that's what, that's the part of the reasoning that Arius is going about. Okay. Now, Again, the problem comes when they start to look at both what does this word actually mean in Greek, but what's the word in Hebrew, and what's it, what does it actually mean? And it doesn't mean created, as in the, um, this word that is used in Septuagint is the same word that's used in Genesis, when God creates. So, so fancy terminology is ex nihilo. Um, which means out of nothing, right? God just says, let there be, and there he is. So it's that same word that the Septuagint uses here that is used in Genesis. The problem for with this is that Hebrew word is only used in Genesis for creation and nowhere else in the Bible. Okay. So nowhere else other than the first six days of creation does God create out of nothing. After that, um, God's involvement in the continuation of creation is always using created stuff that he's already made. Right. 
So even when it comes to Adam and Eve, mm -hmm. right, he doesn't say, let there be man, and poof, there's man. He takes the dirt of the ground, exactly. what he's already made. And now he, you know, he made something new. So, so part of this is just translation and semantic issues. And then you get down to, okay, so what does the word actually mean? And what does this mean? And part of the way we have to understand this too, again, is we have to. You can't. You can't just interpret one verse of the Bible isolated from what right. the rest right. of the Bible right. says, right. Right. because if you do that, you can make any verse mean pretty much whatever you want, oh, yeah. right? So you have to take it in the broader context of what does Scripture say. Okay. Well, even these other passages that that I just referenced here talk about Jesus as God, right, who was there before creation, okay, and, the, and then especially when you take John 1 into factor, it really highlights that Jesus is not something different than the Father, but he is of the same substance. So then the question becomes, what does it mean, what is begotten? And the answer to that is basically that's the relation, the relationship between the first person of the Trinity, God the Father, and the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, is a similar relationship to an, the earthly Father and earthly Son. And so that that earthly relationship is modeled after that heavenly one, but doesn't necessarily um, mean that. Um, like in the biological sense, like what we think of, right? Of how babies are made. Yeah. So this would seem to indicate there was a time when only God existed, and then there was God and the Son both existed, and then the Holy Spirit came into being. So there's one, then two, then three. Right. So um, another 60 years later, that's the question. Because Jesus yeah. is ironed out, okay, Jesus is God, so what about this Holy Spirit mm -hmm. thing? So that's, we're going we're gonna to put that off to the next um, council, because that's what they have to, that's what you said is, I mean, that's kind of the next logical progression exactly. in these controversies and, and some of these um, different views about who God is. So well, I'm going to answer your question a little more fully here in just a second. So okay, that. I'm just getting guess because I mean I know I know from other scripture passages that you said, but you know the first John that Jesus was there from the beginning. It wasn't a later thing. But I was formed long ages ago at the very beginning when the world came to be. I mean that timing thing is what's tripping me up. So this begotten is this maybe begotten for a specific work? Now it's time. No. I see where you're going, but no. no. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still struggling with how to look at this in light of the other one. Okay. So like, maybe it's not let's really get, Jesus. Yeah, or, let's get to know. Steve first and then uh, to Mark. Okay, so we have the God yet the Father, right? Uh, you know, we've got the Hebrew expression of God is it's in the word of God's form and all that. If Jesus is in God, the same subject. Okay, so this is so this is part of the, the broader issue that the, the Orthodox party is arguing about because if you say that Jesus is a creation, then and um, then that destroys um, the first commandment, right? The 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 main creed and statement of faith of the Old Testament, um, I am the Lord, or um, uh, the great Shema. I can only think of it in Hebrew. I can't think of it in English. <laughs> Hear, O Israel, the Lord, your God, the Lord is one, yeah. right? Um, and so worshiping Jesus in any way, shape, or form would um, be, be flat out against who God says that he is in the Old Testament. Which is what the Jews. So that's one of the charges that when they come back at Arius too, they're saying you're you're kind of espousing this this quasi Jewish theology and um, and denying who Jesus really says that he is and 
God is. And by denying that, not denying that Jesus is truly God, you're also denying the, uh, the Father. Because Jesus says that. But how can you read any passage of the Bible interpreted one way or the other, right? You can just look at the kind of things over there. Correct. And then, so if you look at John 14, right, it's also an argument of the area where Jesus is saying, I'm going to my Father, and the Father is greater than I. Right. So if it's all one, then so if you get basically philosophically just argue almost everything Right. Yeah, yeah. You can. And they and and it has been. I mean, this has been this and this is why we're spending so much time talking about this. Is because even though uh, uh, this gets kind of hashed out in the conclusion, this is what we believe scripture says, um, back you know, way back then. These conversations continue, they continue on in different shapes and forms, and still are today about this. So, I mean, this is, this is extremely still practical um, today, whenever the Jones Witness knock on the door, right? But also, I mean, but there's also um, different, um, which I would still, I wouldn't consider Jones Witnesses as Christians, but uh, there are other uh, Christian bodies who really struggle with the Trinity and really struggle with Jesus' divinity and humanity and, uh, and have a hard time uh, believing but also articulating this is what we believe about this. But if we go back to things even in the Old Testament as Christ is on the cross and it it comes to fruition that everything that was said way back there, like no bones will be broken, this, that, and the other thing, and things like the Dead Sea Scrolls backing up scripture a long time ago, if, if the deity of Christ is to be questioned then, how, how could the scribes, how could the writers of the Bible, hundreds of years before this happened, this crucifixion, and then what does God do with the reality of if he's dead on the cross to save us from sin, somebody's got to get him off the cross and bring right. him back to life. Right. There's so, nobody on earth that can do that, right. so why would God well, do that? And this is this is why all this stuff matters, is because yeah. um, um, everything hinges on Jesus being fully God and fully God. Exactly. All the salvation, redemption of not just ourselves, but of, of everything, of all yeah. the creation. Exactly. Uh, all of that wraps around this. Now, so part of this too is a hard, and we're going to move on to the next passage here a little bit, because we're not going to, I mean, again, we can argue this to death, and it's hard to even understand the arguments on both sides, much less come to a conclusion at times. But um, um, part of this is, is the hard thing to, to answer is, um, what is, what does it mean when the Bible talks about before creation? Because even time, time is an aspect of creation. So you can't really even say before creation, because before is a word describing time. Right? And he always was, right? Yeah. And he always was. He always was. So that's kind of where where we go with this, is when the Lord possessed, appointed me, wisdom, Christ, at the beginning of his work, or the beginning of the way, okay, and the first of his acts of old, we can say, okay, be, before creation, right, there is God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God decides, I'm going to create. And part of this creation is there's going to be time, which means there's a set, there's a beginning. Yep. There's also an end. Uh -huh. Right? Yep. And then there's, you know, eternity. Mm -hmm. Which really isn't, I mean, that's just as mysterious to us as what was before. Right? It's what comes after. Right? Um, saying that Christ was there and Christ was uh, predominant in the creation of the world. And this is where Colossians goes, but also John. Right? That everything was made through him. Because how does God decide to create? I mean, this is, it's 
it's a wonderful play on words, too, that we still don't get. When I say the word of God, I can mean several things. Um, in a broadly speaking, I can call something this way. So when God speaks, he creates by his word. What are we talking about? By the vocal sound, um, words spoken, yes. By the word, as in the word of God that was going to become human to save us? Yes. Right? You can answer in both of these ways. Um, so, um, a beautiful thing, if, and I've mentioned this before, if you guys haven't read it, you should. The Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. Um, and uh, that was the first book he writes, although it's the second in the series. So he goes and writes a prequel. And in the prequel... Um, he uh, 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 creation is described, and I love the way it's just there's there's nothing where not even like blackness doesn't doesn't describe the nothingness <laughs> because there isn't even black. It's just there's nothing, right? And then as God creates, uh, or in, in the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, the blind Aslan is, is Jesus, right? and there. There's Aslan, and he starts to sing, and creation starts to happen. So he sings creation into existence. This is God singing through Aslan, through Christ. So it's a really cool picture um, that C.S. Lewis tries to paint. I, I like that. I like that. Um, so. Um, basically, that's that's kind of where where we come down is that Jesus has always been present, even before always is still is a thing, right? Because that still assumes time that Jesus Jesus is God and as God um, he, he is. Now um, we're going to look at uh, let's jump to Colossians. Um, so we could spend forever talking about this. So. Uh, but let's jump to Colossians. So this is another one of those. There's other passages that um, that uh, describe this stuff too, and that the Arians jump on. But Colossians chapter one, um, uh, verse fifteen, is where we're going to start. Um, <coughs> Colossians chapter one, verse fifteen. Okay. And it says this, um, He is the image, so Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Okay. So both the Arians and the Orthodox party use this to try to prove their points. Okay. Um, the Arians say, look, he's the image of the invisible God, so he's not something different. He's got to be of the same substance. And all the fullness of God dwells in him, not just part. Right? So that's what the Orthodox, and that's kind of what we would say. The Arians say, but, but it says he's the firstborn. Mm -hmm. So then, what? That's not his quality, that's his position. And that's the answer. That's the position, right on. not the quality. So, the Lutheran, if anybody has the Lutheran study Bible, the, the study note does a good job uh, talking about this. So, um, uh, let me see, on verse 15, it says, um, uh, um, so this is the note first. The image says something that resembles the original. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. Adam lost the image of God, but in Christ, the second Adam, God's image is restored. So that's good. Then under the first form, so Arius, a fourth century heretic, misunderstood this to mean the first of many creatures, as if Jesus were part of the creation. But elsewhere, 
it means one who is privileged, like in Exodus 4, verse 22. St. Athanasius, again, so he's, the, he's an archdeacon at this time, and is kind of the leader of the Orthodox party um, in doing this. So Athanasius clear, um, also pointed out that the context clearly shows this firstborn is not part of the creation, but the cause. The cause of it, right? Because he's, everything is... It's a cause and effect, right? And Jesus is the cause, so it can't be part of the part of the creation. Okay. So, okay. so this goes back in philosophical terms. Seems like the first cause, and um, if anybody is familiar with that kind of stuff, but it's related to that kind of thing. So, that's the that's the way to answer this. It's it's in regards to position. Right? Not quality, position. Um, and um, a word here too, um, later on in verse 18, he's the head of the church. So he's the head of the body. So that's what it means that he's the firstborn. He's the head. Right? The, um, the firstborn from the dead. Okay? So the one in position where everybody else who is raised follows after Jesus' resurrection. So how do we know that we are when we're raised from the dead that we're going to be raised bodily? Because Jesus was. That's how we know because he's the firstborn of the dead, right? And then um, that he might be preeminent. So that's another key word. The preeminence um, is tied to the, what this means then to be firstborn. Meaning? And in baptism. It makes it a point in Scripture to let us know that as Christ was there getting baptized by John the Baptist, he was sinless. But God himself comes in there. Like I hear a lot of people say, well, you don't have to be baptized to get the Holy Spirit, and they do it by invitation and whatever else. But Christ has always been the precursor for everything. So showing that right. the Holy Spirit is present in baptism, ours, we are sinful. Christ was not, but the Holy Spirit was there, and the Scripture makes it evident. He said it like a dove, and then God speaks so that the people understand it, whether it be vocal or not, says, this is my son. And so everybody's there. God's there speaking. The Holy Spirit's there descending like a dove, and Christ our Savior is there without sin. But the, there's another precursor of where he came first. Right. So there our is. baptism yeah. contains everything his did except we're sinful and he was not. Right. Yeah. So to me, I mean, this is like more like a struggle that I have like, with my students. Mm -hmm. like, so when they work on a dissertation, exactly. I always tell them you have to pick a framework. Right? What do you believe in? So the Lutheran theologian would say what you just alluded to, right? It's, right. it's position, you read nothing else. But the linguist would say, well, if I go by the word, word says this, right? right? So you can make the same argument. Yeah. So you can make two different arguments with the same text, and that's why they never agree. Right. Right. I mean, that, by the exactly that, right. I mean, that's really what's happening. You know, it, it has, has happened over centuries. Right? right. Yes, that's exactly right. So in, in the theological language, we talk about those two different ways as um, exe um, the exegetical, so that's more just the linguist, and then um, you have the systematic, and that's the theological framework. Mm -hmm. And um, and Lutheranism, sometimes to a, a fault, mm -hmm. usually starts with that framework. Yeah. Um, even though part of that framework, um, ideally, is we got to go back to the text, right? Exactly. What does the Bi What does the Bible say? So that's what Luther does when he like can talk about the Lord's Supper. Is means is, right? We got to go back to what does the language actually say. Um, but sometimes Lutheranism, and this was, um, Roman Catholicism does this too, right, operates in this framework, um, and that's the, st the starting point. Mm -hmm. And, um, and um, so that's a dangerous place to be because you can too easily explain away what is, what is the word, what does it actually say? Because it doesn't fit my box, mm -hmm. right? But the box should be, ideally, right, the box is defined by what the word says. Right. But the framework is 
all encompassing. It's, it's the context of the whole scripture, and the framework, it's the summation of all of it. It's not one passage. No, no the framework is defined by the person arguing. Right. Okay. Yes. So that's that's ours. Yes. 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 So that's that's what we would say, certainly. Yes. Right. It's framed by the whole. So by all the scripture. Let's take this hot word abortion. There's a guy out there on the newscast that says the Bible doesn't say anything about the word abortion. It's not in there. Either. And I'm going. No, but it says everything about life. The whole context of scripture is life, life, created life, eternal life. Right. And destroying life is condemned by Scripture. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I mean, yeah. That, that's okay, uh, we're almost out of time, so there's, there's two more little things I want to I bring up. First, in the book of Revelation, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, right? And the first and the last. So does that mean, do we take that to mean Jesus has a beginning and an end? No. No. We take that to mean he is the beginning and the end. In other words, he's the he's the summation, the completion, the goal, the purpose, the goal of all of them. Right? So that's a that's another passage that we would go to to be like, look, this isn't saying that Jesus has a set beginning and a set end. Right? The same way that you and I have a beginning when we were conceived. Right. That's yeah. So all the I am statements, uh, for instance, when he's talking about before Abraham was I am. Right. That's clearly saying there was no beginning. I am. Right. I am. Yeah. That's exactly right. Which is why, um, you know, that's in the present tense too. Right. Not before Abraham was I was. No. Right. Uh -uh. But I am. And that's a so that was a huge that's a huge statement too, right? Is and that's you know what God when God is telling Moses, right? When Moses says, "Who's who should I say sent me? I am, right? I am who I am, right?" And by Jesus saying all those I am statements, like Bonnie said, right? Or allusions back to Jesus saying, "I'm I am the I am that spoke to Moses." And by the size of the rocks they picked up, they knew what he said. Oh yeah. So that's and okay. So this is the this is ultimately the big thing um, for us too. Um, and ultimately, the reason why we believe that Jesus is is fully God and always has been, ultimately, is a matter of faith, not of philosophy, not of reasoning, but it's in faith that I actually believe what Jesus says about himself, and that I believe it in this way, right? That um, and that's that's ultimately where it comes down to yeah. is you know like in the third article of the creed when we say I believe that I cannot by my own reason exactly. believe in Jesus exactly. Christ and Lord exactly. right but the Holy Spirit is calling me right that's why we believe this and ultimately it comes down to the Holy Spirit working through His Word mm -hmm. and the all this philosophy and the reasons and the argument can be used in service and should be used in service towards that. But it's based off of, ultimately, it's based off of this faith. And that's, that's the, big scan, the big scandal in Christianity, is that Jesus is God. Right? That's, that's the big hiccup. It's not that Jesus could do miracles, or that he was a good or ethical teacher, um, or even that kind of thing, but that he's God, and that he's fully God. Um, maybe I mentioned this to you guys before, I don't remember, but... Um, um, what's his name? I can't think of his name now. Uh, Dennis Prager from Prager. He's done a whole bunch of stuff on the internet now. Uh, very uh, has some really good stuff on um, that he does online. Conservative, um, kind of a, a traditional uh, Jew, and um, he gets a question all the time. And he did a thing on it on why why aren't you a Christian? And it comes down to, for him, and for a lot of Jews, it comes down to this. It's not that Je it's not Jesus' claim that he's the Messiah. It's Jesus' claim that he's God. Right? It's the divinity of Jesus. Right? Not the humanity. It's that Jesus is God, and he cannot accept that Jesus is the stumbling Right? Like, how, how dare anybody claim that? Right. 
And, and to an extent, that's true. How dare anyone claim that unless it's true? Exactly. Right? And we believe it's true because, ultimately, because of the Holy Spirit's work in us. Faith. Our Christian belief feeds into that, right? But you can sort of betray Jesus. He's always the nice person, right? He's pushing with the kids on his back, etc. Right. But when you look at the theology of Jesus and the things that he said, it's really the opposite, right? He's very careful, he's very straight, and he's. Right. he's very straightforward with that too, but we don't talk about it. Though. Not, not as much as we sometimes should have, or, or we sometimes do. Yeah, Jesus is very, um, he's very harsh yeah. at times, and and some of that's just bluntness. This yeah. is how it is, yeah. right? And believe. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, lastly, super fast. Um, the ongoing significance of this stuff. So. Uh, this is the most important gathering of Christians since the Council of Jerusalem that shows up in Acts. So it's been three, uh, 250 years-ish. The most significant um, event, and it shapes everything that comes after, even us. Right? We're still saying the Nicene Creed, which is the official document of this is what this is the conclusion of the Council of Nicaea. There's others, but this is um, this is what we believe about who God is and what God has done. Now, all of the, um, everybody signs on to this except for Arius and two others. Now, it, it helps, and maybe not the best tactic, that Constantine says, get on board or you're exiled. Um, and um, so Arius and two others um, Refuse to sign on. They're exiled. All of Arius' writings are, and books are burned um, and destroyed. Followers branded as heretics, enemies of Christianity, but now that also means um, uh, possibly enemies of the state. Too. And the first time where Christians persecuted. Where Christian, yes. First time where Christians now are persecuting Christians, which is incredibly sad. That you move from a generation earlier, from the worst persecution Christianity experiences in the early church, to now Christians persecuting each other. And the state being used as a tool to do that. Um, I mean, our sinfulness is just astounding, right? How quickly we turn against each other. So that's a sad result of that. Um, so, um, a couple other things. Um, um, this doesn't just settle the whole thing. Right? Arius goes off. Um, Nicaea is declared a bloodless victory. I mean, that, you know, that event anyway. Right? Um, yet, really, that's more an appearance than in reality. Political and ecclesiastical circumstances shift. Athanasius, Arius is welcomed back. Athanasius is exiled and branded as a heretic. Right? So he goes off for a while, and this controversy breaks out again and again over the next two or three generations. Okay? And each side excommunicating the other, the emperor being swayed depending upon who, who, uh, who's speaking into his ear, basically. Right? So, this goes back and back and forth. For the most part, in the eastern part of the Roman Empire, Arianism is the dominant force. The west uh, mostly sided with Athanasius. Okay? In 350, the tide turns against the Orthodox party. Again, Athanasius is exiled. Arianism has the upper hand, although it's a little bit of a milder form. This is where you get the word homoousius. So they compromise a little bit, and we'll say now we're going to say he's of a similar substance, not something completely different. It's just he's kind of like God. It's still not fully God, right? Um, but the, the um, uh, really things are solidified and done until 381, which is the next council that we'll talk about. So that helps to solidify. The Council of Nicaea, and then addresses as, as was brought up before. What about the Holy Spirit, and and what's His role in all of this, and is He really God or not? Because at the end of the Nicene Creed, all it says, the original one, just says, and I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
period. Okay, so that then becomes the next rule. Yeah, what's that? I mean, who's that? What's that? Is that God or not? Um, so that's what we'll talk about later. Um, now, some of the other, um, uh, a couple of the other things. So, you still have, again, Christianity and the Roman Empire figuring out what does this look like that we're not hostile towards each other, right? And this plays out in some different ways um, throughout for centuries. But one of the good things that happens is that um, sometimes, especially more the liberal historians would say Constantine had a real heavy hand in determining how, you know, the beliefs of Christianity. He didn't. He didn't decide anything. Um, but, but in fact, by the end, by the time three, uh, the end of the 300s come along, it's gotten to the point where um, Ambrose, who should be a familiar name, Ambrose of Milan is able to rebuke the emperor and tell the emperor, you're a subject of Christ, you say you're Christian, um, you have to go by what Christ says. Your authority comes from him, not the other way around. And, or you're not on equal playing fields. Which, a result, Arianism lifts the emperor up on earth, would basically separate this and say the emperor is to the earthly kingdom as Christ is to the spiritual kingdom. Right? So, Arianism does this, um, comes around, uh, so thankfully that, for the most part, doesn't happen. Um, this also, though, helped set the scene uh, for generations and hundreds of years to come on the articulation of the Christian faith. In other words, to be very clear that we need to be clear and precise in what we believe and what we don't believe. Because these things actually can matter, both in terms of the spiritual stuff, but also earthly stuff. And so uh, this, this kind of sets the standard for everything that comes afterwards on Christians clearly articulating this is what we believe and this is what we don't believe. And, um, and as kind of Mark was saying too, some of that framework that we use on how we do theology and what, you know, what is our source and our basis for making these claims of, of faith. So... Um, Next week, we'll get into the next one. And, and just a reminder again, there's way more here than we can ever talk, actually talk about. And it's, I mean, we're just scratching the surface of this stuff. Um, um, and even that leaves us with a headache sometimes. So what are we doing? Yeah. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. All right. Let's um, let's say prayer. Right. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this time. We thank you for the most importantly for the faith that you have given to us. Faith is a, a gift of God, in which we don't deserve, but which we have gladly received um, by the working of your Spirit, so that we might believe that Jesus really is true God and true man, that he really has died to save us and been raised for our justification. So help us, O oh Lord, to cling firmly in faith to you um, as you reveal yourself through your word. In Jesus' name, amen.